a, a brief review. We actually spent a fair amount of time. I hope it wasn't uh, uh, as I hope it, it was as as effective as I hope it would be uh, in reviewing all the things that have to happen in order to see organisms change and develop. <coughs> The proposition, as we spent some time on last week, was the variability that leads to change in an organism's history on this earth is provided by genetic mutation. We also emphasize that the thing a gene does is to encode and cause the production of a specific protein. That protein provides the phenotype that natural selection is supposed to choose between. And of course we use choose in a very mechanical way. Uh, so that's really quite important. Uh, if the variability that is necessary for change in the characteristics of organisms on Earth, Earth is dependent on mutation, then we need to know a lot about mutation. Another theme I emphasized early last week is that today's technology allows all of us, evolutionists, creationists, uh, people with a scientific background to use techniques, we, we can now go into the genetics of any of these organisms, and rather quickly, as we will see, comparatively speaking, do a complete analysis of the genetic makeup. In this way, a do, comparing organisms can de define precisely what the mutation was. And that's extremely important. As a matter of fact, the major part of the presentation today is going to emphasize what I think think is, hands down, the most effective study of evolutionary speciation that's ever been done. Because not only are they, uh, and I'm, this is not where I'm starting, but not only did this group uh, focus on Darwin's finches, let me just say parenthetically, having been in this game of doing uh, supported research for quite a few years, it's very interesting that there has been almost unlimited resources applied to the study of the evolution of the Galapagos finches. And we're going to spend a bit of time with that. I think I'm safe in saying, uh, both with experience and a little bit of I don't think too much hyperbole, that if the finches in the Galapagos had not provided a major foundation for Darwin's propositions about evolution, the money, which has been almost without end to study it carefully, wouldn't be there. Now, the study of Darwin's finches I think I'm right in saying, is being supported even by such august, uh, basic, highly credible scientific institutions like the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The major video I'll show you today was produced at their cost. And typically they're in medical and very advanced molecular biology, but the relevance of Darwin's finches cannot be overstated in terms of what is happening, what their proposal is happening in evolution. However, as we'll see, it's a very two-edged sword. And so let me go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't believe this. I hope this doesn't happen in the middle. Well, I don't know why that doesn't want to go away, but anyway, it doesn't.
forgive me. This was all set before I came. Now, this is where I want to be. Okay, let's do that again. I'm going to go back and... uh, We ended up with a peppered moths last week. Uh, interestingly, Behe does not say very much at all about peppered moths in Darwin Devolves, or even in his previous book, The Edge of Evolution. And frankly, I think there is a good reason, and that is the 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 phenotypic change in peppered moths is in response to a newly minted dominant gene. And is an example of a gain of function mutation, which is admittedly by everybody who's into the area far enough, is very unusual to find gain of function. Because uh, this this change right here, with the appearance of the melanistic form, is from a new gene, a new area of the genome, rather than being some change in the genes that are creating what was the characteristic for uh, these organisms. So, uh, pardon me, I'm still a little flustered from things going very differently than I thought they would, but let's, here we go. So, basically, this form of the peppered moth, which became prevalent during the Industrial Revolution, as we reviewed, Uh, is a result of a gene that became active in a different part of the genome. And they've been able to make reasonable predictions in terms of when this happened in the peppered moth uh, story uh, so that it was not, it did not precede the Industrial Revolution. It came along later, but soon enough to rescue the peppered moths from perhaps extinction by providing this melanistic form. But uh, there's only one way to describe it, and that is a gain-of-function mutation that worked. But it is a single mutation. And there, I'm going to skip through this video you saw before. And go on to the example, which is one of the opening examples uh, Behe gives in Darwin Devolves. And that is the evolution of the polar bear. Uh, the genetic origin of the polar bear was the Elast- is the Alaskan brown bear. And polar bears and Alaskan brown bears can still, are still interfertile. But uh, as the brown bear population expanded, it expanded into areas where its dark brown coat made it too obvious. And so there is a gene called LYST that encodes and causes the brown pigment in the fur. A loss of function mutation I I should add that the gene for this brown pigment has mutated a number of times. But about 80% of the mutations were loss of function. And the brown pigment became lighter and lighter. 
with an obvious advantage uh, for polar ball po- polar bears as they move out into a new area to survive because they're going into the snowy, colder areas where the brown bear didn't do well for the opposite reason. So the loss of function mutation is the ability to produce brown pigment was either reduced, giving you light brown polar bears, or completely unexpressed, giving uh, giving the polar bear we're familiar with. Uh, this, again, it's a loss of function mutation, very clearly, with a positive selective advantage. If you think about it, that makes for quick change. Because this this is going to be expressed all the time. It isn't waiting around to suddenly be expressed. It's being expressed all the time. So if, if the gene mutates and the coat, coat's going to get lighter, it's happening right away. And selection happens right away. So uh, the mutation fr- from the LY, uh, mu- the mutating LYST doesn't always give the same result. A substantial number directly produced a unpigmented fur coat, a white coat. And some of the mutations created the partially pigmented coat that we showed. However, there is another aspect to this evolution that's very important. And that is that the food sources in the white areas of the Arctic, the most abundant are seals. Now, most mammals cannot live on a diet of seals simply because well simply that's the wrong word because the seals have such a huge amount of fat that there is an insulator but consuming them just simply brings in too much fat and throws the metabolism and the whole effectiveness of the consuming organism off and is, on balance, more negative than positive. Polar bears had another loss of function mutation in a a gene that's been dubbed the the APOB gene. The APOB gene, as I say, increases the ability to use fat as a major energy and nutrient source. But that's actually negative for organisms consuming seals. So, we have a loss of function in the APOB gene, and now a polar bear who has a food source it can use with much less negative outcome. So, B emphasizes two loss of function mutations creating polar bears with the obvious advantage for them living in the Arctic conditions where it's white, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot more to the story, but What's interesting about it is, it's a mutation in a gene that's simply expressed all the time. It's not, if the mutation happens, it's not going to be hidden, as, uh, as, as some can be. So, those two mutations are fundamental to the large, relatively large number of polar bears living in very cold, white conditions. Again, both loss of function, and thus able to have very quick effects when that loss of function is selected for positively increasing survival. And that is foundational, I believe, to Behe's approach uh, that we will go further with.
Now, the major, the major uh, part of both weeks is going to be a more careful look at Darwin's finches. And as you know, Darwin on the Beagle spent a fair amount of time uh, sailing around the Galapagos Islands, and he saw these finches that were different. He saw these birds. He didn't call them finches at the time. These birds that were on different islands and were different from each other. The adaptations seemed to open up different food sources. So, the story is that a single finch species was blown in from the mainland, which would the closest is Ecuador, and there is a, a species of finch, and we should put finch in quotation marks, which I'll come back to. Uh, there is a species of finch on the mainland, and the whole group of finch species in the Galapagos are very strongly related to this mainland source. So, mutations occur that control bill size and shape, and they seem to be fairly frequent. I might add that the genes we're going to talk about with Darwin's finches are not what we call structural genes. Structural genes make proteins that provide phenotypes. Uh, regulatory genes provide proteins that then regulate the activities of other genes and affects their protein production. So a change in a regulatory gene can be even more per pervasive than a change in so-called structural genes, which produces the immediate phenotype. And so this was noted immediately, this change. This was one Darwin picked up. S rather similar looking organisms, but one with a very thick, robust bill and the other with a rather thin bill. These bills opened up different nutrition sources. And that's very clearly documented. And as a re result, affect their survival of these various finch species. We're going to talk about three genes for bill size and shape, which over time actually mutate multiple times. Now I'm going to pause here again. Because of the importance of this study to those providing funding, this group, which will say more about it, and I might say in terms of doing good science, I have a great deal of respect for. Anyway, they seem seems like they almost simply say have to say we need money and they get it. Because what we will be going through results from having complete genome sequencing done on hundreds literally hundreds of Darwin's finches collected on the Galapagos Island. And so they have been, by doing this with what they would consider an ancestral genotype and a mutant genotype that's functional, they can define precisely what the mutation was by, the, a, by an identified nucleoside difference in the two. It's extremely powerful. Now, I can't resist jumping ahead. Uh, some of you who were here last week might remember the mechanism called CRISPR, where sci science now, especially medical science, can identify a problem with an individual's DNA, cut out that sequence of nucleotides, and replace it with ones that they think may help. You think of the power of that, and medically, that's wonderful. Uh, could we go back and repeat, quotes, mini or microevolution the same way? I think the answer is probable, and I'm guessing this will be happening in the near future, 
with Darwin's finches. Anyway, uh, because of the multiple changes in bill size and shape, we now have a whole group of species. Uh, down the road here a little bit, we'll be talking about 14 different species of finches that are only found in the Galapagos Islands. The story really is one that depends on a couple of excellent scientists, uh, a husband and wife team who took on evaluating Darwin's finches and figured they'd be there for two or three years. Their study has been extended over 40 years, and frankly, in my estimation, it is the best documented and clearly demonstrated study of evolution at the genus species level. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for that. Using tools that if we had the resources and wanted to go down these roads, we could do as well. Because the tools are not exclusive to doing the kind of work the Grants did with their finches. So let's look at that. planet has millions of species, over 300,000 beetles alone, 17,000 butterflies, thousands of mammals, fish and birds, all astonishingly different. How did so many species come to be? To seek insights into that question, Researchers are focusing on places where species recently arose, such as the remote Galapagos Islands. Scientists are making observations and conducting experiments that would have surprised Charles Darwin. And they're discovering new insights into what the great naturalist called the mystery of mysteries. How new species form. Galapagos Islands are one of the most spectacular landscapes in the world, home to a variety of species that live nowhere else. Biologists Peter and Rosemary Grant have been seeking answers to how species arise by focusing on one of the smaller islands called Daphne Major. When we started out, we had uh, no plan for the long term. In fact, we thought it was just going to be just uh, a few years, maybe two years. Two years have turned into a 40-year odyssey. The grants have returned every summer since 1973. Oh, that's a bad. Is that three or six? Okay, three or six. Three or six. Here, they've made some of the most remarkable observations in the history of field research as they studied the famed Galapagos finches. The finches were first brought to scientists' attention by Charles Darwin. When his voyage around South America brought him to this cluster of islands, 600 miles from mainland Ecuador. These volcanic islands are geologically young. They began rising from the ocean floor less than five million years ago. At first devoid of life, they now support a modest number of species. Among them, 13 species of finches found in various combinations on the different islands. The birds live in diverse habitats. The islands are very different from each other. They differ in size, they differ in topography, and in height. 
Larger trees grow at higher elevations, while low islands have mostly cactus, grasses, and shrubs. In these diverse habitats, the finches have evolved many ways to survive. So, Rosemary, what's the important difference between these birds? This little warbler finch with its very fine needle-like beak is perfect for picking off insects. This one is the woodpecker finch with a rather more robust beak. It concentrates on beetle larvae and, and termite larvae. Then we have the cactus finch with a much longer, sharp, pointed beak, which probes into cactus flowers. And then these three species are the large, medium, and small ground finches. So, Sean, the basic idea is the beaks are tools, and you need the right tool for the right job. The finches look so different that Darwin first mistook them for entirely unrelated kinds of birds. How did the Galapagos end up with so many species of finches? In terms of the actual history of the finches of the Galapagos, um, there were many different possibilities. Different kinds of finches could have all come from the mainland separately, or the finches could have all evolved out there on the islands. And what do we know about that? Well, now we know from DNA evidence that all of the finches are more related to each other than any one is to a species on the mainland. And that tells us only one species arrived on the archipelago and diversified into the 13 species that we see nowadays in the Galapagos. So they've all come from a single common ancestor. The question then becomes, how did one ancestral population give rise to many different species, each adapted to a different lifestyle? A crucial insight into how adaptation occurs came when the grants focused on one species on the island of Daphne Major. A factor of great convenience for us was the small size of the island. That meant that we could walk all over the place. Oh, there's a bird. I'll leave that one to you. The idea was that if we worked really hard, we could follow every individual or almost every individual. They rose at 5.30 each morning to net the island's medium ground finches. The beak net is... They measured the size and shape of each bird's beak, the bird's weight, and they tagged them for identification. The male is 17418. Year after year they returned, at times tracking over 1,000 finches. So here's an example of a bird we know intimately over the whole of its lifespan. The number is 5960. We know how many times it bred, which years it bred in, how many mates it had, how many offspring it produced, and then how many of those offspring themselves survived long enough to breed. Over the first four years, little seemed to change. Then in 1977, a terrible drought began. Virtually no rain fell for the next 18 months. The vegetation practically disappeared, apart from a few trees without any leaves, and of course the cactus bushes were still there. Now the medium ground finches had to compete for scarce food. They started off with a big food supply of small seeds, medium seeds, large seeds. As these small seeds became very scarce, they had to turn increasingly to the large and hard seeds. Well, only birds with large beaks can crack open these woody, spiny fruits. The birds with the smallest beaks had the most trouble. They were scraping about amongst the rocks and their plumage got so worn that they could barely fly. That year, 
over 80% of the medium ground finches died. We would go around looking for birds that had died, and it's very sad to pick up a bird and say, 3972, oh no, not that bird, oh. When they inventoried the surviving medium ground finches, they discovered that one trait had made the greatest difference between life and death. Well, I'm showing here a distribution of beak depths of the population in 1976. The survivors of this group are shown in black. Oh. So the larger the beak, the better your chances. The larger the beak, the higher the likelihood of surviving through the drought of 1977. 18.6 grams. When they looked at the offspring, they found an even greater surprise. The average beak depth was more than 4% larger than the previous generation. Natural selection had changed the average beak size. Could you have ever imagined measuring and observing something like this on such a tort, short time scale until you actually did it? When we started, the answer is no. We could not imagine we would be able to do it. But was this a fluke? Or are changes like this happening all the time? Five years later, in 1983, an unusually strong El Nino brought 10 times more rain than normal. And the island was overrun by vines that covered even the cactus. The rains changed the vegetation on the island, such that two years later, when drought struck, larger seeds became scarce. The birds with larger beaks now had difficulty picking up the more abundant food the small seeds produced by the vines. That year, many more finches with small beaks survived. And their offspring inherited smaller beaks. So the selection had swung in the opposite direction and evolution had occurred as a result. In an amazingly short period of time, the grants had measured evolution of beak size not once, but twice demonstrating that when birds encounter different environments, they will change over a very short amount of time. Over millions of years, changes like these, occurring throughout the Galapagos, generated all sorts of beak sizes and shapes. But that's only part of the story. How did finches with different beaks become distinct species? Species are defined as populations whose members don't interbreed. So how does one species split into two? A typical scenario is that two populations become separated geographically and undergo enough change in their respective habitats that if or when they come into contact again, they do not mate. So in the Galapagos, the grants asked, what keeps different species of finches from mating? We were very conscious that on any given island, the different species sing very different songs. This is what a cactus finch sounds like. Whereas the medium ground finch sounds very much like this. So to see if songs keep the species apart, the Grants and their student Laureen Ratcliffe played each species' songs through a loudspeaker. When we played back the cactus finch song, cactus finch came to the loudspeaker and the medium ground finch completely ignored it. The males only responded to songs of their own species. The Grants looked at whether finches might also choose mates based on appearance. So they put out stuffed female specimens to see if males would respond. Clearly they could discriminate. The male vigorously courted a female of his own species, completely ignored the other one. The males only courted females that had a similar size and similar beak. 
song and appearance both play a role in keeping different species from mating. So when populations of the same species are separated, changes in these traits set the stage for the formation of new species. The grants have shown that both geography and ecology are keys to the evolution of the Galapagos finches. The most likely scenario is that two million years ago, a single finch population arrived from the mainland. When their descendants reached another island, they faced new conditions. As those isolated populations adapted to their surroundings, their traits changed. If the changes included traits involved in mating, and the populations came into contact again, they no longer mated. They had become distinct species. While unique to these remote islands, the history of the Galapagos finches offers a general insight into why the world is populated with so many species. The more diverse the environment, the more opportunities for evolutionary change to produce those new species. Over 150 years after Darwin first recognized their significance, these unassuming birds still illuminate how the great diversity of life arose and continues to evolve. So there's a, a very thorough study done using good science. I think most of us who've looked at it agree. Ending up with conclusions that if we think about might not be all bad. So let's go further. Uh, I'm considering them to be an outstanding example of rapid speciation dependent on random mutation and strong natural selection of beak size. BMP4 is a regulatory gene involved with promoting beak size. When it's most active, the birds in which it's most active have the largest, most robust beaks. Like Magnorostis, that's a good descriptive term, isn't it? Big nose. ALX1 is another regulatory gene that affects the sharpness of the beak. There were two mutations, and remember this is all done by genome sequencing. Uh, there are two mutations in ALX1. One is associated with sharper beaks and the other with blunter beaks. Both mutations damage the function of the ALX1 controlled protein. And an outcome was for this activity is documented in this way. Big heavy beaks and narrower finer beaks for reasons I think the video gives a reasonable explanation. There's a third one, HMD2A in finches. It's a regulatory gene found in two forms. One is active in large beaks and the other is associated with smaller beaks. So we, we have three genes that have been evaluated. 
These are all regulatory genes. They are not structural genes. And noting that after a drought that favored smaller beaks, finches with large beaks, with the large beak isoform of HMG2A, were less common. They've been able to show this again with genome sequencing, etc. Now, this is a, a message to me, and I wonder if you share it. After many years of working with Adventist young people in a biology program, for which one of the major goals was having them leave our program with their faith intact in Genesis and creation. But nonetheless, if we simply think of a post-flood situation, are we in a position to criticize documentation of rapid speciation? No, as a matter of fact, that's just the opposite. I think it makes the kinds of changes that have occurred much more understandable. And let me point out something slightly different. And I don't want to do science on this. I'm, I'm personally a strong supporter of the Genesis story. But in order to do this sort of thing, or in order to change as the environment uh, favors changes, organisms must have some way of changing genetically. I think the story of the same genes, particularly regulatory genes, mutating in different ways brings diversity to the population that's facing immediate strong selective pressures. The diversity can be there ahead of time. This is a major part of the grant study, and I personally if I were still teaching, I would be using this to my students as an example of the design, not just in what's there, but in how it can d diversify, which makes the story of creation with a relatively small number of organisms in each group more readily uh, understood in terms of what we see going on. I hope I didn't just uh, become so unclear you're not following where I'm going. In other words, I consider these mechanisms personally as a major explanation to show how a short chronology in many species could work. Uh, this is very interesting. I decided before giving this presentation I'd go back to the literature and I found a December 12, 2018, which is not very long ago, paper in Science. And science doesn't publish things very readily, which documented, they say, the establishment of a new species in the Galapagos in three generations. That's pretty fast. And it involved mating back hybridization and mating back with a hybrid form. Again, increasing diversity. Uh, incidentally, uh, I'm going to show you something in a minute that involves 14 finch species. I believe the count now is 17. So you've got to stay right on top of it, stay up with what has been going on in this wonderful laboratory for diversity, selection, and survival. Yes? We need a definition of species here. Uh, could they not reproduce? Hey, give me a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's coming. At least my take on it is coming. Okay. Have you noticed the three studies we've talked about Peppered moth camouflage, finch beak size, polar bear color and nutrition are consistently used to prove the reality of evolution via variation in phenotypes that are chosen by natural selection. Well, of course, you've, not you've noticed that, at least from the presentation today. But
Uh, it's the, this is especially true for peppered moth and uh, finch beak studies. In your view, do these studies validate ev evolution by random genetic variation and natural selection? What we've just demonstrated is what we often and probably still call microevolution, right? Which seems pretty valid and quite necessary given the, the history that we believe has passed on this earth. However, which of these studies demonstrates the evolutionary origin of new species? Peppered moth? As a matter of fact, interestingly, no. And yet pep the peppered moth story of survival with color change has been used without new species coming along by the evolutionists as about the only solid scientific study of the importance of variability and natural selection. But there are no new species of peppered moths that have been recognized. So I find it very interesting that at that time, this was played over and over again. If you don't believe me, go back and read textbooks, of uh, biology textbooks of 10 or 15 years. Uh, it's a good story, but it doesn't demonstrate species. And yet it was used to validate this huge evolutionary change. Interesting. The finch beak. Uh, and this is coming back to your question, Ariel. Uh, depends on the definition. Uh, in the finch beak studies, uh, they were not completely reproductively isolated at the point where they were recognized as species. There were occasional hybrids recognized, and now especially with the new gene genomic studies, they can say this with more authority. Uh, at that point, we get into a discussion. This mating, intermating, is less frequent. Now, as a biologist, for me, if I find a group of reproducing organisms that remain distinct, even if there is occasional hybridization between them and, and another group, I'm not bothered by using the term new species because they establish populations that maintain the difference and, and can be separated even though there will be some integrates with a little bit of hybridization. So for me, and I don't know how it would be for you, Ariel, and I'm not asking you at this point, uh, this is the answer that we usually find. The barriers have not become so complete that the hybridization does not occasionally happen. In fact, in the three-generation study of a new species of Darwin's finch, they felt it was because they hybridized the change was so rapid. And so I would say th the same thing for the polar bear. So uh, I would also note now that these studies, which are probably as good as it gets at establishing uh, the genetic basis for real evolutionary populations you can go back to and study, we're dealing with a maximum of three genes, which is interesting, isn't it? And these are now the textbook examples for evolution of any sort. Again, noting that uh, uh, the number of genes involved. I, I think in this group we've agreed that new species could evolve, microevolution, etc. Can we extend the evolution of new species to believing that new classes of, of animals could, could arise? You know, we're talking about kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So I'm going way up. Does anything we've talked about today, which I believe is about as good as it gets for clear documentation of evolution, substantiate going to these higher levels? 
Well, could we use Darwin's finches as a basis for understanding how the whole class of birds, class aves, originated? Uh, the evolutionists now clearly propose that the class aves originated from dinosaurs. They have found one or two fossil skeletons of dinosaurs. And I don't know, Leonard, you may be more up to date than I am, but I think there hasn't been very many fossil dinosaurs found with feathers. <clears throat> but they apparently do e exist, and I'm not going to go through that. They then take this through Archaeoptic, Archaeopteryx, which is sort of the first bird. Uh, and that's a very sketchy pathway. But basically what they are pre presenting is a group of dinosaurs called the theropods, which were bipedal, originated class, a, uh, class aves, developed from them. And so if you don't want to believe a dinosaur is extinct, are extinct, you're surrounded by them, according to this. Because we have little dinosaurs walking and flying and doing the, doing their thing. Is that possible? Well, Richard Dawkins, in his book *Climbing Mountain Probable*, created a metaphor for large-scale evolutionary change that he called mountain probable. Without defining it now, I want to move ahead as our time is moving too. Uh, it is a metaphor, and we'll come back to it. His answer, too, is that possible? In other words, birds originating at the class level from theropods uh, is absolutely using cumulus selection as the device. Now, Michael Behe's answer, too, is that possible? <laughs> absolutely not. So, let's move on. Dawkins to the rescue. Dawkins was asked the question, how long would it take a monkey at a typewriter pushing keys randomly to come up with any particular statement? Uh, So Dawkins chose a line from Shakespeare, which is, me thinks it is like a weasel. So Dawkins developed a simple computer program, which is really a model of what the monkey was doing. And that program became known as the weasel. So he set up this computer program to model natural selection, um, to model cumulative selection. And when he got it going, the program saved all of the random letters that the monkey typed that were correct. In other words, correct letter in correct position. Program saved that. But here's the next thing, and see what you think of it. The program discarded the mistakes as if they hadn't happened and had no effect. So Dawkins started the program before lunch and by the time he'd returned the program monkey had correctly typed me thinks it was like a weasel. What's wrong with that? Somehow, I do not believe that Richard Dawkins is completely unaware of genetics. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm just going to take 30 seconds. There was a time in my career when uh, I had connections with Oxford University, and uh, Richard Dawkins was a student in that program of a Nobel Prize-winning animal behaviors, Nico Tenbergen. 
I know for a fact that his Ph.D. gave him no special background to talk about this. He was a behaviorist. Tinberg and a Nobel Prize winning behaviorist. Uh, at one point, he and I talked about doing some collaborative stuff, but since then we've, we've lost contact. But I know he doesn't come to his present role as one with a great deal of experience with the data. He's better, he's more of a popularizer, which has become a theme for some of the people at Oxford, and I won't go into that, but you may have heard of the book, The Naked Ape. That came out of the same group. Anyway, so what is wrong with cumulative selective? I'm going to just go through this quickly. Wikipedia, Wikipedia defines in the following way, that the overwhelming majority of mutations, 70 to 80 percent, are negative. So Richard Dawkins' human selection didn't recognize the fact that the organism that had gotten this good gene would have to survive a lot more mutations before it got the next good gene. And what's the probability that it would even be around? Disappearingly small. And this is the core of Behe's criticism. So the naivety of the, the monkey is astounding. I'm going to go through this. This is simply a reminder of how important the three-dimensional structure of proteins is. We went back through that. And that is the alignment of, of amino acids from the enzyme, lysozyme, uh, with the sugar that it, it's going to digest that link. But it can't move slightly. It's got to stay right there. Now I'm going to go flip on through that. Uh, ch changes anywhere in the molecule could, in fact, damage lysozyme. And incidentally, once uh, the lysozyme enzyme is damaged, it has no regulatory function because the enzyme has to be recognized by regulatory proteins that keep from making too much. And if, the, if this control mechanism isn't recognized, it starts making lysozyme, 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 lysozyme to the point where it becomes destructive to the kidneys, dealing with all the extra protein. And it's, it's in a very important pathology. Of course, that's irrelevant when you want a certain outcome. Uh, lysozyme, and I may have gone through this before, but let's do it again. The lysozyme gene, there are 43 mutations recorded, 29 result from changes in single nucleotides, seven from nucleotide, Tide duplication, five from deletions, two from insertions. Of these mutations, 15 are pathological. 12 are uncertain, but possibly pathological. 11 are likely benign, but may not be benign. Only five are shown to be benign. But what is particularly interesting is none of the recorded lysozyme mutations have a positive impact. And this is, this is a database the government keeps because of the possible uh, pathology involved. So, I want to bring this to a quick close. Let's go back. Here's Dawkins' Mount Improbable, okay? You'll recognize it as Half Dome. Uh, so, how do you get, get new, a new class of annuals such as AVs, according to Dawkins? Dinosaurs to birds. That's simple. Like this. Here are the dinosaurs. That's where change has to go in order to create a new class. And nobody, including Dawkins, would suggest that that is possible. So, how does mountain probable come in. Very simple.
get rid of that because it's not going to work. And so we start over here on the backside of Mountain Probable with a theropod, and I'm using change in size to indicate evolving toward birds because they did get smaller, according to the evolutionary theory. Uh, then you just keep going, and then sooner or later you get a bird, which changes. Now, each one of these steps has to happen, and then a long pause, because Dawkins' magic is cumulative selection. A good change happens, the organism survives until another good change comes along. Ignoring the fact that there will be eight to ten times more negative mutations impacting that organism than the positive ones it's waiting for. So, with this critique, we actually have to redo this. Noting that individuals with positive phenotypes will most likely be lost due to additional negative selection against new negative uh, phenotype, mutant phenotypes. So, the reality of mountain probable is this. You couldn't get very far. And so, there you are. There's mountain probable. But this book, and I used it in, in class, has gotten rave reviews by evolutionist after evolutionist after evolutionist, understanding that they think cumulative selection is the answer. The only way good scientists could be that naive is by out of hand saying that this is the only possible way. Well, we're talking about philosophical naturalism. It can't happen any other way, so it must have happened this way. Fortunately, we didn't have a hard time getting our kids to understand what they were say, saying and doing and why. So, I would say that Dawkins with, wait a minute, I'm not quite done, I hope. <laughs> yes, here we go. Behe's edge, edge of Evolution. Let's illustrate it with Darwin's finches. The family of Darwin's finches are tanagers. Uh, and uh, it's uh, Tropidae. At the time, this information was we had 14 species of Darwin's finches in three generations. And that is the, uh, that is the proposed, these are the proposed uh, relationships of the various species, with this being the ancestral species from uh, the mainland. I'm proposing something else based on what Behe has said. Here's the family. Forgive me for turning this upside down, but it was the only way I could work. This is at the evolution of the finches, all below the family level. And so... Behe describes the origin of family and above as happening via intelligent design. He says this is where evolution is active. And for him, the, this is the edge of evolution. Evolution happens below that. And he's documented it, I think, pretty well. So I enjoy, I've enjoyed reading his books and gaining from them, but that's the end of the presentation.
questions? Yes. I was <clears throat> curious about what what's the scientific pressure to say there are 17 different species of finches rather than just saying there's there's one species there but some populations happen to look a little bit different than the others the greatly reduced interbreeding they they maintain their difference if they were freely Hybridizing, the differences wouldn't be there. There, there was some hybridizing. Yep, there has been a little bit of hybridizing, and they consider that to be important because it keeps the diversity in the uh, in the mix. Uh, you pass. Like Dawkins' weasel thing is is very interesting. It says something besides the science. Um, of course, a big problem with this weasel example is in the weasel program, it knows what the target is that, it's, that evolution is working toward. That, I mean, Dawkins certainly knew that evolution is not like that. His, his weasel thing illustrates that intelligent design could work, but evolution doesn't. And yet I've seen much more recent, uh, some, some apparently very good evolutionary scientists uh, uh, refer to that example as being something marvelous. Well, how could they not understand that it doesn't say any, it doesn't work, it's simply stupid? I, like you, Leonard, I am totally, frankly, floored by the naivete of sophisticated scientists simply because they don't have any answer, the other answer to come up with. <coughs> who's, who's, okay, yes. Yeah, very good presentation. Uh, very enlightening. Uh, where do we go with this? Is immediately, hey, uh, and I tend to agree with you know, that. Uh, I'm not quite hearing you. <laughs> uh, there are lots of. <laughs> My hearing aids, sorry. I tend to agree with your idea that a lot of changes have occurred and so on. Uh, and I get into some of the more thorny problems we face, like uh, all those sharp teeth in the mouth of the lion that don't seem to be uh, exactly uh, designed to eat straw, uh, the talons of the eagle in their beaks that, uh, uh, well, it's Work pretty well for uh, uh, predation on fish and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, uh, is this a solution to this? A question that uh, creationists have about uh, an original creation that was uh, perfect and has degenerated. How far can we go with this uh, in answering this predation question? I, uh, Ariel, I have struggled having been in advanced biology education for so long. You've struggled with that question over and over again. And the way you phrase it, my answer would be either the designs you mentioned were part of original creation or you see a huge amount of creative ability to the negative forces in this world. They actually can go in and create and manipulate and cause this to happen, which was not part of the original plan. Neither of these is, is a, to me, is a satisfactory answer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna chicken out. I, I think you can go one way or the other. Uh, I am less bothered with a less uh, with the ability to use food and other things in different ways that many do not feel as part of the original perfect plan. Uh, I'm not to the position where I'm saying it couldn't have been there. I simply don't know. 
and I didn't know how to interpret it, I'm equally bothered by a negative force with that tremendous level of creative power. Yes? Mm -hmm. I will attempt to answer this question somewhat. Let's suppose that we have a big guy and, uh, shall we say, not so big guy. The big guy would obviously have an opportunity to abuse the little guy, but does he have to? The fact of sharp teeth do not necessarily imply you have to be carnivore. Uh, an example but of that is panda bears that have sharp teeth like may, may others, I, uh, but they eat bamboos. So they're vegetarian. It, 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 doesn't that seem to be to me? I'm with you, and I understand that. But why would a creator create them with that, with those characteristics, and expect them to be very inefficient in using plant? sources. Well, uh, the problem, Even when you look at the digestive system, it carries through. The digestive system is also adaptable, as has been shown by certain studies that showed when you have a carnivore that is switched to a vegetarian diet, the intestines grow longer. So are you suggesting that the creator put the genes in to make talons on an eagle, but didn't set up a way for them being expressed, which sort of happened later. And pardon me, I'm throwing out the kind of questions the kids love to throw at us. There are many options that we have at our disposal at all times. The problem is, how do we make the choices? And the choices are the ones that decide what we become. Unfortunately, most of us feel that the choices are made for us. And so we abdicate responsibility in our lives. But throughout our lives, we're either going, growing closer to something noble or further away from it. But somehow we were given the ability to move farther away from it. Part Again, I'm, I'm being the devil's advocate. I've had to live with this. And I mean, frankly, uh, having talked with our seniors in this capstone course, we did not have a particular outcome that we wanted everyone to walk with the door with as long as they saw that these changes occurred within God's creatorship. A um, couple of things. Uh, one of them is that the... Uh, uh, the fruit bat has very long, sharp teeth and uh, has uh, subsists mainly, if not entirely, on fruit. Um, so the teeth can be used for more than one uh, kind of activity. Uh, and the other one is interesting is the, the Kia parrot. Uh, you know, eagles have very long, hooked beaks that are ideal for ripping out mm. pieces of flesh. Well, it turns out parrots also have long hooked beaks that are ideal for eating flesh. Most of the time they don't. Uh, the but, uh, but the Kia parrots uh, were put in a, in a sort of forced to be in an environment with uh, a lot of sheep and not a lot else because the rest of the environment was cleared for sheep grazing. And uh, they learned to uh, predate the sheep to the point of killing them. Well, let's make it really complicated. Let's throw in epigenetics and try to come up with a convincing proposal in any particular direction that excludes the others. Who, who is next? Um, is, is there somebody who's going to tackle this? You first. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I, I'm somewhat familiar with some of these, uh, how should I say, snags that are thrown out. And what bothers me about that is like the person who decides to rob somebody on the street and they explain their action by suggesting there is so much injustice and you have and I don't have and I have to write this unfairness and I'm going to do that by robbing you. Uh, you can see immediately that that argument fails in its very fundamental premise. Uh, but it does not prevent people from using that kind of an argument. The question is not whether people can use such arguments in various directions. The question that is really pressing upon us is how was this originally meant to function in a peaceful, happy, fulfilled universe? And how is it going to all function together in a happy universe where there is no violence and no need for it? And nobody will ever use it as an excuse that we have to have it. I... I would venture to suggest that our current life on this earth is a grand experiment for everybody in the universe to witness what works and what doesn't work and what cannot possibly work on a long distance time scale. Temporarily, many things appear to benefit the crooked, like the criminal can advance himself quite well for a while until there is nobody innocent to prey on. And then what happens when only the crooks are left? Well, uh, I guess I would say all of these perspectives I have shared, evaluated, I'm still looking for answers. I'm not the last word, but... <laughs> Uh, returning to the lion's teeth we were talking about earlier. Um, interesting statement in, I think, Steps to Christ, um, that Satan was responsible for the thorns on the rose bush. Um, but I put this in the context of after the fall, one of the curses was that God withdrew his blessings from the earth which allowed things to happen that would never have happened if God's blessings had remained in control of maintaining earth's functions um, but you have no problem with God allowing it it was the result of sin blessing is the result of obedience and I probably person. should quit playing devil's advocate because I keep asking questions for which I've only thought about but haven't come up with solutions as well. Blessing is the result of obedience and cursing is the result, the consequence, the natural consequence of sin. Um, all climbs are adaptable for the cactus, for example. And oh, that fits well, into this, but my... <laughs> I wanted to say one other thing, that um, God foresaw that he was going to give people free will, and that if we had free will, we might make the wrong choice. So he had to build into the human genome in Adam and Eve before the fall, the potential, and in their anim and the animals, the potential to take care of themselves in the way you mentioned, um, in situations where violence would be the, the, the rule. The excretory system, for example. Um, and cactus is able to function in, in practically from the equator to the Arctic surface uh, circle. Um, but to me, the God foreseeing that he would have to have latent 
genes waiting and and epigenetics waiting to um, function in a fallen world that never would have functioned in a unfallen world. Yes, this is this is a theme that is very easy to develop. Uh, however. I must confess that when one of my students asked me, well, did he have to go so far as to create T-Rex? I have a problem. T-Rex doesn't have any kind of a... anything, and correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, uh, there's nothing about a T-Rex that suggests it could live other than on a predatory diet. Genes are Pardon me? How can a T Rex print in flesh when his teeth were telling the hockey street? Many people have commented that T Rex's teeth are for all age to I love him. His teeth do not. Well, I've, uh, I've, in the skeletons I've seen, uh, they have very well developed, uh, very well de- developed canines. Like, Of course, all the answers are in the movies that recreated <laughs> recreated dinosaurs. Well, I guess <clears throat> now he's really th- not talking about the length of the teeth, but the length of the roots. So it tells how much strength do they have. Mm-hmm. And there, there is there is argument about the diet of, of T. Rex. But anyway, um, I don't have an answer for all these things either. But some of the arguments that are used really are not as good as what they're the way they're portrayed. As somebody else has mentioned, talons and and uh, beaks can be used for various purposes. Maybe the biggest change is in behavior, but also the the the, <clears throat> the the complexity of the mammal digestive tract is often portrayed as a really big problem. Uh, but but actually, the the difference in those digestive tracts are not that great between a carnivore and, and a fruit eater, for instance. The big change is when you get to a grass eater. That's where you have the really long uh, complex digestive tracts. It's not, you know, in the in the other in the other groups. That's true, certainly. And I think of the group here. Leonard has looked at these uh, these particular situations, and Leonard and Paul more than any of the rest of us. But I would say back in my history. Um, I wanted our students to come out understanding the problems but with a faith that we wanted to model that was so strong that these uh, these problems could be understood and dealt with intellectually without it disrupting their Christian faith and trust in the Creator. I have a sim- Let's see. Yes. Oh, did I, I'm sorry. I thought we were going to do it next, but go ahead. Okay. I, I have a simple question, actually, a two part question. Um, I don't think there is such a thing as a simple question <laughs> okay. here. But um, when I hear that, I begin to think, oh, oh, what's coming? Uh, it's okay. It's quite simple, I'm sure, for you. <laughs> um, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> uh, it's, it's in regards to the polar bears and, and the uh, change in the color and the ability to digest the high amount of fat. Does one of those happen first, or do they happen about the same time? And second question is, with the change in the climate and the uh, um, ice caps melting, is there any evidence that the polar bear is going to be reverting back to the... Well, I guess the best we know is with that happening, the polar bears are approaching a population size that could not make it through. Oh. But uh, as I have read, I believe the digestive mutation is thought to have happened first. So it would open up finding enough nutrition in those environments. Uh and then the color change came along as an additional positive change. Does that... Yeah, that is, would you pass the microphone back behind you, please? Uh, Uh-oh. Thank you. 
Uh, I, I wonder if sometimes we are uh, overly impressed by naturalism to the to the extent that uh, that even as uh, as Christians we we lean more towards naturalistic explanations than spiritual ones. In, in the sense that, uh, say, say for instance, since since God warned Adam and Eve that if, if you sin, you shall surely die, and and if we look at uh, Romans eight where it talks about uh, as a result of what they did. Uh, death and decay and, and futility entered into the creation. Isn't it given all that? Isn't it possible that that uh, that at the fall uh, we don't necessarily have to look to, to to naturalistic events to explain subsequent behaviors and phenomena, but rather that God could intervene in His creation and and make supernatural changes to many organisms that would that would end up playing out in the manner that we've seen things happen ever since. Of course, that is that is a part of the discussion. Uh, in our culture today, we tend to respect more an explanation that can be bolstered mechanistically. Well, I, I think I don't think we need to be backed into that corner because there is no naturalistic me- uh, mechanism for the existence of the cosmos. The biggest question of all. Yes. So, 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 why give that away? Well, I right after uh, entering the Adventist educational system, finishing my doctoral work, etc., I was enthusiastic and answered uh, a series of invitations to spend a weekend with the church and talk about these issues. Uh, I learned I was being naive and I quit doing it because I learned I could not expect the average lay Adventist to understand that as scientists I needed to consider options that to them were just unacceptable. And when I inferred that we had to think about that, I got a label. And I felt like as I walked away, I'd done more damage than good. So I quit doing it. I found that when I was invited to a group that knew me and trusted me, I could do it. I had one particular experience I won't take your time to go into, but uh, where we... Well, let me use this. Have I ever told you my story about migrating birds being studied in in solarium, planetarium. Right when I finished my doctorate, which was my specialty was animal behavior, the work had just come out in which migratory species were put in the planetarium and the direction of their movements within a cage that gave them a chance to move matched the direction they would be choosing in migration given the star pattern that would have been there at that time. I thought this was just so exciting that my first class I taught part of general biology. And so enthusiastically I told the kids about this and all the wonderful things that uh, our Creator had put in organisms that we're beginning to understand to even inherit star patterns in a part of the world they'd never been in. I got a long lecture after that lecture because one of the students was a theology major. He read me the riot act. He said, you cannot pretend to explain scientifically God's miracles. You're destroying the kid's faith. Are, are Unfortunately, you, that guy appeared as a campus pastor for one of the secular campuses, larger campuses in that area. And my positive experience working with students was being asked to come to talk to those graduate students in this program to give them a little bit better approach than they were being told by their campus pastor. Well, are, are, are you saying then that... Uh 
that after the creation, God no longer does anything other no. than what he's already pre-programmed no. into? No, not at all. Well, it sounds like it. In what in, way? In other words, if, if, if our priori we decide that, that there, there can only be naturalistic explanations for the phenomena that you've been talking about today, then where, where is God today? Or at the fall? Well, I have to apologize. If, if, if you heard me saying that, it was totally unintentional. Because it was exactly the, the opposite that we wanted to inculcate in our training program for hundreds of advanced biology students. That God is still active, can be active. There are no limitations. We didn't offer them saying God did this then, but... Right, but, but, but the earlier discussion was about, well, how do we account for, for uh, big teeth and, and dinosaurs and all... And, and, and all kinds of malicious behavior and destructive and predatory behavior. How, how can we reconcile a loving God with that um, and, and looking for biological, naturalistic explanations of that? There, there's a, it, it's impossible to look at it exactly the other way around. Namely, it's precisely because God said, if you do these bad things, then death is going to occur. That's the fulfillment of what he said, not a negation of, of his character. Well, I thought I inferred that exact statement. My apologies if I didn't, because uh, the one thing we wanted to deal with, these, these things are real, and if we don't allow God to have done it, either in the original creation or maybe as a later adaptation, then who else is left? Exactly. And that's exactly where, where we didn't want them to go. So I... I have intended to agree with exactly what you're saying. I guess I missed it. But thank you for bringing up, in case someone else might have understood me to say that. I'm going to have to leave in a minute, but not because it's not really <laughs> enlightening to me. Without going into the deep weeds of all this other stuff, where I would get lost among all the brains here, what I learned today... I have yet to see you lost. <laughs> Glad you're here. <laughs> oh, um, What I learned today from the finches, when Darwin first got there, they were birds. Whatever, uh, 200 years later, they're still birds. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, and so that's what I learned. Uh, who, uh, there's some guy I, I watch on TV sometimes... All of these reactions that happen, and it's all started chemically. He said if a chemical is working on, on some direction and it doesn't work, it doesn't remember where it was. It goes clear back to the beginning. And, and so that's why it never makes the jump from a bird uh, to a whale, whatever they want to say it changed to. <laughs> Chemically, it doesn't know where it's going. And if something happens in it that destroys something, it goes back to the beginning. It doesn't start from where it left off. Am I right in that? Uh, have any yeah, a process doesn't have any memory. So I enjoyed this. We started with birds. We're ending up with birds. And... You can't take that, you can't take the Galapagos to uh, uh, evolution in general. You know, it does something locally, I agree with that. Well, that was a theme I hoped I would end with effectively. Well, I got that, and I thank you for that. Anybody else? And thank you for being the kind of group that I don't have to be nervous about being misinterpreted. If you think you don't say it, you don't understand what I'm saying, you let me know. And that, that's very much okay. Who? Would? Oh, well, two points. Uh, one point about um, peppered moth. Um, I remember in my high school textbook the peppered moth story and the illustrations. And at the end of the chapter, there would invariably be questions uh, about what the implications are and all that. Same thing with Darwin's finches and their beaks. 
So with the peppered moth story, I have since read that the peppered moths actually do not land on tree trunks, but are rather up in the tree canopy. So that well, being the case, then, how does that change the entire logic of the narrative? Let me, let me answer, first of all, something I know you're not doing. But one of the things that really disturbed me in preparing for this was to read the amount of resistance among in the creationistic literature to the reality of any kind of change in a peppered moth. And that th there was no evidence that birds even preyed on them. Thus the whole story was bogus. by creationists who didn't want to yield any any ground to change post creation in other words sounds like Washington these days I'm not going to comment <laughs> so, some of you are too well informed uh, anyway it's uh for me, it's been a fascinating career, and part of this, even though, as I, you know, it's not in my background professionally, it's been very enjoyable, even exciting, to interact with bright young kids and get them thinking and hopefully walking out the door. And I say hopefully, we have an assessment that we were at least 80% successful walking out the door with a faith in the Genesis story. Um. Thank you. That's that, that's wonderful experience, and I wish that more would replicate that kind of outcome. Um, as far as Darwin's finches are concerned, I have a Scientific American paper that has traced the average beak size of Darwin's finches over several decades, and they have basically shown that there are certain limits within which there is a uh, movement up and down, but in the end, it doesn't exceed above or below a certain size. That being the case, it, it kind of directly confronts the age-old question in high school textbooks regarding those types of issues, where I've generally had to answer Yes, if you have several repeated droughts, you would gradually have the ratchet effect of ever larger beaks progressing uh, indefinitely, presumably. But that's not the actual case of what is actually observed. Well, I, I have looked at the educational literature built on this since I wanted to be more... It's, personally, I'm very interested in it. And... Uh, I've gone through materials based on Darwin's finches that are quite sophisticated, that are prepared as work experiences, study experiences for high school students. And I have not picked up anybody who's pushing the idea that there's no boundary. Uh, if you understand, <laughs> if you understand a bit about the way this usually goes, you expect there to be boundaries on either end. One would. Uh, I'm perhaps mm, showing a little bit the date of my high school <laughs> education was a while ago. Um, well, mine was a lot more a while ago than yours. Uh, but I, actually, this was so pervasive, uh, I almost don't want to admit this. No, I do. That when I was teaching general biology, they actually developed a lab based on the peppered moth. And so we got two kinds of backgrounds and we had paper peppered moths that we could put in these different ones. And then we would have students with just a peek and then not do guided movement, see which ones they would choose based on the background. And it came out every time. They did the ratios, et cetera, that they were talking about change in the characteristic based on the background. 
And that, uh, I think now, Darwin's finches are replacing the peppered moth in this, this kind of literature. It's much more sophisticated. Just, so, um, who else? Just a comment. Oh, sure. Um, you were talking about the birds migrating with the sky in their brains pre-imprinted be before birth. Um, and there was a comment that this would undermine faith in God as, you know, the creator. Um, I th there's a little series of books, volume one and two, little tiny books um, for the layperson and for younger youth um, about the wonders of God in creation. And, and they quote that kind of story that you told about the birds having the uh, sky in, imprinted in their brain. And to me, those booklets show that God, right at the very beginning of creation, had many things pre-programmed into creation. But equally, Scripture tells us that he is continuing, continuing. He is the maintainer. And we, the whole universe and this world cannot exist if he isn't continuously at work in what we do. And just because he did some things ahead of time and they're already built in, and there are many, many stories in these two little booklets by Tucker, T-U-C-K-E-R. Um, you can get them from the Quiet Hour, but it's not by either of the Tuckers we know the name of. I think probably some third cousin. Um, and and the stories are wonderful, like your story about the, the sky in the bird's brain from different kind of animals. But I, I certainly would not say this is trying to get a naturalistic explanation for the miracles of God. It was a miracle that God put this in the bird's brain to begin with. And he has miracles every day for those who are open to his miracles. Mm -hmm. In what sense are you using the term miracle? Well, it would <laughs> the most prominent one would be to save a soul like me. <laughs> well, it, and, and I think I, and since we've talked before, I think I understand what you're saying. But uh, we are constantly, and at least to some percentage, not, not universally, but percentage, accused of worshiping a God of the gaps. That as soon as we understand something, God no longer did it. Because God only works in mysterious ways. And if we can understand it, then it becomes part of the mechanistic approach. It has to be mysterious. And uh, that is subtly, especially in the philosophy some use in discussing, that's still there. And it's a very disturbing. In other words, God can't work in ways that we understand logically because it's no longer mirac miraculous. Okay, I'm not saying that. No, I know you're not. I was thinking in terms of spiritual miracles. But you're touching miracles. on it. You gave yes, me a chance yes, to bring up how important it yes. is to understand that God may be making changes that make total mechanistic sense, except yes. that he's doing it. Yes, I think he deserves, just this morning in Patriarchs and Prophets, that uh, there are a thousand, ten thousand blessings every day, things that God does for us that we totally ignore. We have another participant who's been waiting a while. No, I, I just... Um, quick comment that I... This is really very interesting Sabbath school class, and thank you. It's the first time I've attended, and, and I really enjoyed it. Thank um, you. So, uh, but just a small question. I, I'm just wondering, with the rapid back-and-forth evolution, evolutionary speciation kind of changes with the finches that they observed... I mean, has anybody looked at whether or not that's actually genetic mutation versus epigenetic change? I think I'm accurate saying, Paul, that in today's literature, they're one and the same. If I understood you correctly. Well, 
we, Ep- we knew we we didn't understand you. Yeah, epigenetic change is, is a change in the way the genes are expressed more than um, actually a, a change in uh, the the sequencing of the genome. So and it's and it is heritable. Okay. So I'm just I'm thinking. I guess, I, guess I, would, up I would then repeat my answers. They're one and the same. Because we don't, we don't know of any way a gene exerts its influence other than by encoding a protein. Mm-hmm. It, that's the intermediary. Because the gene itself, when you look at its structure, is not designed for anything but being a library with change, mm-hmm. a storage of information. It can't do anything. Well, maybe I can make that a little clearer. Um, sometimes there's a, a change in the gene structure itself. Uh, sometimes there's a change in the methylation or acetylation of the bases, which is inheritable, but a little easier to change. And it is often not clear which one of those is happening. Um, and I don't know that well, we well, can... Well, that's true. I, I, I know and, where you're going, but... And, and so... That's, that is... The, the only thing we can really say is if we sequence a gene and there is a change, then that by definition is a genetic change. Yes. If we don't sequence a change, uh, or if we sequence a gene and there is no change in the gene sequence itself... Uh, then the only way you can tell whether that's epigenetic is uh, if you can show that it, the expression somehow has changed. Yeah, so, and but, is that from the regulatory gene for that gene, or is that from the uh, from the methylation? Or uh, the only way you could do that is by checking to see how much methylation there is. Um, and while sequencing a gene is pretty easy. Uh, checking on the methylation of genes is a whole lot more difficult. But it, and so some of this stuff we're not going to have the answer for. But isn't it, Paul, in Paul, isn't it true that methylation affects the probability of expression rather than the actual protein expressed? True, but if you have more of a protein, you can have a phenotypic change even though the... Oh, sure. Sure. Even though the gene itself has not changed. And, and, and so if you're asking, do we know? Well, the answer right now is okay. not entirely. But if you, do have a, if you do have a sequence change, you can pretty much nail that down, that it is, in fact, a sequence change. So it's just, it was kind of interesting to me because it seems like those could, the, that epigenetic change yeah. could be responsible for the rapid back and forth, but it doesn't change the genes. The genes are still the same, but the expression is different. And so yeah, well, um, there, that could there account are a for some of, ways of this rapid. Of affecting the probability of expression of a gene mm-hmm. uh, without changing the structure of the gene. Yeah. Uh, I have yet, and Paul's better informed than I am, to see evidence that the probability of expression. Uh, expresses a different form of the protein than a low probability. It's, it's, it's the amount of that protein. Now, if you want to get into the depth, and I'm only midway depth, you get really into depth, I don't know what your background is, there's an awful lot more to this, uh, to, to the way this is regulated and, and the way it acts. Yeah, and I guess I, I'm not a geneticist by any means. And, and, uh, I don't know that much, but I, my next question would be, can epigenetic change direct genetic change in the long run? I don't know. It's just curious. No one knows. No one knows. <laughs> yes. The answer is yes. Kind of. Um, uh, cytosine methylation, which is the usual methylation form, actually predisposes those... Uh, methylated basis to, um, how should I say, mutation, because uh, uh, they become mutation hotspots frequently. They change to uridine, or, or more precisely thymine then? That's right.
Well, one more question. Uh, I thank you for. Oh. Oh, oh, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago about the God of the gaps. Is it your position, or is it the position of some that that eventually there there will be no more gaps because naturalism will understand all phenomena, and therefore God will be completely vanquished? Say that. Say that again. Is it your position? You mentioned earlier about God of the gaps. Yes. Uh, and and you said, well, that those gaps are getting smaller and smaller because uh, humans now understand more and more mechanistic processes. So I'm I'm wondering if if it's your view or the view of some that 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 if we were to eventually understand all mechanistic processes, there would be therefore no uh, no need for God at all anywhere. Either, either well, prior to creation or during creation. My position on that has always been, as I understand so-called mechanistic uh, changes, I understand the author of those changes even better. So as the gaps disappear, my faith in the, in the creator grows. Okay. So I guess my, my my real question would be... But I don't have to have that in order to have the faith. But it's kind of appealing to say, well, so that's the way it does. Boy, that's really a brilliant way of doing it okay. in human terms. So uh, so I guess, I guess my real question would be then, uh, we would be phasing out the need for the supernatural. I mean, I, I don't believe that, but I'm just trying to follow your line of reasoning. Well, I, I, I keep dodging these questions by answering with questions. To me, the supernatural is defined by what I don't understand. Um, You're right. You're not answering my question. You know, if 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 I come if, if and there might I come to the point and say there's no way I'm going to understand it. I believe this is the Creator's uh, doing. And he's so far ahead, but I would not, I would not, my faith would not be destroyed as my understanding of how he did it grew, would be strengthened. It sounds to me like your faith is primarily a natural process. No. The faith is there regardless of understanding the natural process. No distinction. Um, may I, may I mm -hmm. chime in? If you were given a treasure map with an X, what would you do with it? Well, I'd take a look at it. And then? Check it out. Uh, meaning? Try to follow it, right? Go uh, you go someplace and start digging. Yes, but it's a false analogy. Why? Because what's being postulated here is, what, what the question is, what... What exists? What's the what's the ultimate ontology? Is, is it dualistic, i.e., supernatural and natural, or is it all natural? <laughs> um, I was, um, I was a two-year-old once, and I implicitly trusted mom and dad, but that didn't stop me from learning or asking questions for that matter. In fact, it was because I trusted mom and dad that I asked questions. It is not, it was not that I asked questions because I did not trust mom or dad. It is because I trusted them that I could ask the questions. Do you see, the, the problem is that you are giving us the option that we're asking questions because we don't believe in God. No. That is a false option. I'm not suggesting that. Well, I said, okay. I said just case, the opposite. In that case, then we're basically um, on the same point. We're basically looking at what God did, and we're wondering how did he do it, and why did he do it, and what's the point of what he did? How can we understand what we're supposed to mean in all of that because we're our questions are biased 
they're, 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 they're slanted from a certain perspective, a naturalistic perspective, i.e., if we can't understand how God it, did it naturalistically, then we don't really want to think about that. Well, our questions cool. are... No, no, no. Our questions are always based on whatever uh, answers we are seeking. Clearly... We can be biased. The questions can be biased, yes. But we have to recognize that they can be biased and then we'll see if we can correct the questions somehow. But to stop asking the questions altogether is not an option. Agreed. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, but you're, you're simply... Let me, let me just say one more thing. Let, me, let me enter here. Okay. You're simply rephrasing God of the Gaps that if we come to the point where we can understand then, then God somehow we're too ready on. to dump, dump God and say he didn't do it no I'm not saying that I, I don't, I'm not sure you're okay. with all due respect I'm not sure you're I think, I think we both understand we believe in the incredible unlimited creative power I, I, I'm, I'm trying to ask a more, a more fundamentally basic question that seems to come up in all this namely is, is ontology dualistic or monistic? I.e., is what's real simply naturalistic processes? Or is there another level to reality that, that, that is not subsumed by naturalism? I.e., it's supernatural. Do both of those things exist or just one of them? Well, well I could rephrase that question okay. by asking, is the universe a closed box or an open one? Well... Could you answer my question? What, what's your view? Is, is, is it dualistic or monistic? I'm not sure that that distinction is particularly it's, helpful. It's right at the heart. Of, it's the bottom line. Oh. I would say those of us who've been down this road a long ways resist very strongly being pigeonholed. I can see that. Well, maybe I can answer... By, by defining that if we think this, we must go to that conclusion. That's simply not true. Uh, maybe I can uh, make a point here. If God created things in one day, there, uh, or one day at a time for six days, uh, then... We have no reasonable mechanistic way of explaining that. Um, God may very well have intervened in his creation in other, at other times. He may have built in some of those interventions. He may have... Uh, intervened in a supernatural way somewhat analogous to the way he created things in the first time at the first time uh, and to prejudge that is to say that you know something that you don't know uh, sometimes some things that look supernatural are going to turn out to be naturalistic Sometimes, and this is one thing that is really hard for modern scientists to swallow, but they need to anyway, some things that look naturalistic are going to turn out to be supernaturalistic in terms of there's no mechanism for them. And probably the best example I can pull out of that is quantum mechanics, where there is no known, and the more we look at it, there is no apparently possible mechanism. And I only say apparently because we don't know everything. If you, if you judge from the appearance at this point, um, it looks like there is period no mechanism for it. And so now the god of the gaps, which the gaps has slowly been shrinking, suddenly there's a huge hole torn in that curtain. Um, and so it's very hard to say what God is doing directly and what God is doing immediately without looking at the problem. And I think that it, it behooves us to be very careful not to put God into any kind of a box 
that he can't get out of. Um, I think that the uh, approach of trying to explain everything on the basis of naturalistic processes is in fact doomed to failure in the end. But exactly where the lines are, we don't know, and we would be best off not trying to say dogmatically, because our dogmas, unless they match his, are likely to turn out to be wrong. Yeah, that's why I'm just asking the more generalized question of dualism or monism. I, I, I don't think I'm misstating where you would feel comfortable. No, you're not. Understand the process in terms of how it functions. The original seems so wonderful. I have gained it, not lost it. In perhaps a certain aspect of of God. And, and perhaps to the exclusion of other aspects. Oh my God, it's not you with me. Exactly. I agree with that since I think I think it depends on what you want to do. Are you want to find uh, dualism or mono, uh, monism? Uh, you can make your monism. You, broad enough that it includes dualism. So, uh... uh yeah, it's hard to even know what you, you, you have to redefine these terms uh, in terms of the context you're using them. Uh, however, I would say uh, I'm comfortable with saying, well, God usually... God created the laws of nature. This makes science possible to work. Uh, and as a creator of them, he can manipulate them and it sure looks to me like he's done it a lot of times if you want to call that dualism fine to me it's God is all powerful and he's my he's he's it, he's it and that's monotheism so take your choice of a hurdle we have to overcome in order to bring such an event about. We have to figure out how to resurrect something. <laughs> yes. So it's not a small task. No. It's not a small but challenge. Hand, uh, <laughs> I mean, Yet they don't pop into existence without intelligent intervention. Yes. Well, <laughs> if, if, let, let's say some third world country wants to 
claim to have created an automobile. They take a VW and pull them apart, make all the parts in their own uh, their own shop and put it back together and it works. What's the claim? We know what it means. They don't care the fact that the total directions and understanding what to do didn't start to rain. Uh, there, there's a, uh, a really interesting book that maybe uh, you're all familiar with it already. It's called The Scientific Approach to Evolution. And, and they, they make a distinction between low confidence and high confidence science and so forth. And very well done. And I think um, it, it, it's uh, worth considering. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the points that they, that they bring up is if, in the scenario that you described, if life was able, able to be created in the lab, we still couldn't uh, objectively know that that's uh, that, i.e., created in the lab by naturalistic processes being reworked by uh, the intelligence of, of the of the of the experimenters. We still couldn't know that that's what happened initially because we weren't there to observe it. Well, I want to thank you for uh, uh, your presentation and thank you for staying to the, uh, I hope not bitter end, but <laughs> ne next week we're going to build on this because we're going to find a new, uh, just brand new genetics that have come out about the monarch butterfly and how it shows that most of the adaptations that happen are actually destructive adaptations that are beneficial because they uh, they ruin something that uh, normally is helpful but is hurtful in this particular situation. And destroying information can be actually selected for, which is, I think, the major point that uh, Darwin Devolves is making. Exactly. And it has the advantage of showing the change of the people rather than getting buried in the population.